you are looking at something totally uninteresting, a blank screen. Some of you are looking to the left, others to the right. Your eye is unengaged. But now, instantly, I've changed that. And you just followed the cute white bunny there, and there, and there. I'm following it too. We can't help it. Our eyes just crave difference. Difference is the secret of compelling art. Well, one of its secrets. See, repetition is generally boring to look at. The model you want to emulate looks something more like this. The idea is the differences engage your eye and make it care about what it's looking at. This concept can manifest in different painting fundamentals. For example, a difference in value, light versus dark. Here's a difference in edges, hard versus soft. Here's a difference in direction or flow. Here's a difference in size. Here's a difference in level of activity. And last but not least, a difference in color temperature. In all of these examples, your eye can't help but notice those differences and be engaged by them. Looking at this in the abstract, like these examples here, is helpful because it gets us thinking about visual language. The artists at Studio Ghibli are masters at implementing difference. This shot, ignoring that little totem in the middle, is largely comprised of a wall and a path. Those items are not inherently interesting. If I were to have painted this in my early student days, it probably would have looked something like that. The physical subject is still readable, but the picture is less interesting. The wall is the same value and color from top to bottom. There's room for something like this, value and temperature difference. The shapes on that wall are very checkerboard-like in the sense that they're repetitive. Perhaps adding in some countervailing diagonals could help throw off the scent there. Also, that wall only has a few shapes on it. They're all very similar in size, too. There's lots of room for difference there. How about these stones? Again, too much of the same shape. Even their outlines have equally hard edges. Repetition is the antithesis of difference, and it's so easy to make too much of it. Now, watch the screen. The original painting's coming back. There it is. Look at these nice differences happening in the wall. Color and value differences, and the texture adds shape differences. Back to the color difference for a second. Most of those colors are derivations of red, but I love what's going on in this area. That little bit of texture has a bluish quality to it. If we plot the average red of the wall here, and we want something to look blue in that context, you don't necessarily need to traverse this whole path. This painting stops its journey to blue around here, which keeps the color choices connected to red, but still offers a great enough difference for it to appear like a nearly opposite hue. All right, back to that wall. The cast shadows from an off-screen tree are designed as diagonals, offsetting the otherwise linear stuff happening. The cobblestones on the ground are all kinds of sizes, and there are differences in edge from hard to soft. Remember that the idea of difference is abstract. You are never only painting a wall or only painting cobblestones. You have to consciously design in those abstract differences that make something interesting. I use this analysis all the time when painting from photo reference too. This is a snapshot I took, and I like the overall mood, but if I'm going to spend hours doing a painting, I want to maximize what I can get out of it in terms of these differences. One thing I like about this photo is that there's lower activity in this section and higher activity in this section. I can study that difference in a quick, almost abstract thumbnail here. I'm using only the rectangle lasso tool and a few values. There are more shapes and more value contrast where the focal point of the house is, and less of those things in the foreground path. And I think that would work, but I don't love how much space is given to the less active part. I think I can implement those same differences but in a condensed frame, more like this. Now, we are potentially running into another problem, where the distribution of difference is split in half. This is actually quite easy to solve. In this beautiful Richard Schmidt painting, we can almost identify that same issue. However, there are these lines that carry difference from the more interesting top half into the less interesting bottom half. Imagine that weren't in the picture, and it looked like this. Does it still read? Sure. But now you got this big blank area, which, yes, still offers a difference against the more active area above it, but it's too obvious now, too in your face. These lines in the composition help distribute that difference in a more pleasing way. Speaking of lines, my snapshot here presents a danger of too much rigid repetition between horizontals and verticals. I will probably want to introduce differences there. You have to be careful though, because if you wonk out something structural like a house too much, it no longer looks like a viable living space. So I'll probably have to leave the house fairly linear. The tree and its shadows, however, offer me lots of raw material to add difference to that checkerboard pattern. 
it's probably worth doing an isolated study of to get a sense for the different shapes, different directions, different values, all of which are contained in that one area of the photograph. And when I evaluate my own study here, I'm looking for those abstract differences, shapes for example, to see if I'm understanding the utility of the reference. So whether it be from reference or from imagination, these are always the concepts I have in mind before setting out to paint. Because I have an overall idea now about how I'm going to deal with these abstract differences, it becomes possible to start rendering out one area. I already know from my studies how many shapes need to go here and roughly how the lines go, so I'm just gonna go for it. And then later I can use the other areas of the composition to balance it accordingly. In some parts of the photo, again like here how the tree casts shadows on the house, I can pretty much reference that directly because I really like how nature has already distributed those differences. I am, of course, interpreting the reference in my own style. Your chosen style doesn't matter though. The fundamentals of design lie underneath all that. Some stylistic choices, however, are quite related. For example, how I'm using color here. The house in the photograph is a light blue, but I don't want the house in my painting to just be one color. I want to wiggle that color around, you know, play with some related tones and maybe make it more engaging by adding difference. All right, I've zoomed way out and I'm trying to figure out how these lines go in the rest of the composition. See, what I'm trying to avoid is subliminally creating a checkerboard. You know, lines that cross at roughly the same angle. I want to steer my painting away from that. The house is checkerboardy enough. I didn't want to redesign that too much for reasons I already explained, but the driveway, the lawn, the wall, the garden, I will heavily redesign those to create difference against that house. The abstract decision I'm arriving at is something that fans out more in the foreground differentiating from the parallel lines at the house. Okay, remember the difference in shape study I did at the beginning? The nice thing about having that figured out is I can use any technique I want to actually execute it. Here I've loaded up Blender, a 3D program. I've matched the camera perspective to my painting and I'm roughly assembling that wall with actual 3D geometry and a 3D light source. And it's key to note that the number of shapes I'm making is very influenced by my early study here. And then of course, once I have that render, I can composite it over the painting, get it sitting in there, flatten the layers, and just continue working. The footage you're seeing now was taken several hours later, when all of my abstract shapes have become detailed things. And I swear I'm not trying to be all draw the rest of the owl here. This is actually the point of the video. Those early abstract decisions you make, which can be done quickly, are what carry you through the arduous rendering process and make all of those hours amount to something. So like right here, when I'm adding in little flowers and plants, I feel like I'm not just painting those things. They are rooted in those early decisions as to what kind of differences I'm implementing in this picture. Differences in shape or edge or value contrast or flow, color temperature. Those are the things that make the final image engaging. So my patrons will get a high res version of this piece, as well as a more in-depth look at how I integrated Blender with my process. Thanks for watching folks, subscribe to the channel for ongoing content, you can find longer art lessons at marcobucciartstore.com, and I'll see ya in the next video.